Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the MP Evans Group PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout the, this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your InvestMeet company dashboard and we will notify you by email when these are ready for your review. I would like to also remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we be begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd like to now hand you over to Executive Chairman Peter Hadsley Chaplin, Finance Director Matty Colson, and Executive Director Chandra Shakuran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro, and uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for attending today's uh, event. I've had a, a little uh, sneak uh, look at uh, uh, the at attendees, and it's good to see quite a few uh, familiar faces. So uh, uh, thank you to all of you, and we look forward to being in touch with you all soon. And thank you for to any uh, uh, people who are new to MP Evans who want to learn more about us. Um, this is uh, essentially focused on our results, but we'll give you a little bit of a, a, a broader introduction to the company and to what, what we do uh, at, at, as well. Uh, and uh, uh, you've been introduced to, to us, the executive team. Um, I, I would just like um, um, to, um, uh, a number of you, uh, uh, know uh, Tristan, who was with us for Tristan Price, who was with us for 15 years, um, who um, decided uh, around the middle of this year to move on to new career opportunities, but uh, who um, uh, was CEO for the last um, uh, uh, five years of his time with us and played a very important and central and key role and uh, amongst his many, many uh, attributes, he, he was always very passionate about sustainability and it's something that we too feel passionate about, uh, but we all wish uh, Tristan very well uh, in, in his future ca ca career path. Um, for the moment, I am managing uh, as executive chairman those responsibilities previously managed by uh, Tristan, um, and any announcement on a replacement CEO will be made in, in due course. Um, but um, I am very ably uh, supported by my colleagues, uh, uh, Matthew, Finance Director, and indeed uh, Chandra. Um, and I'm delighted uh, that he's been uh, appointed to the board and he's already proved extraordinarily uh, valuable in terms of the contributions that he's been made direct to the board in two of the board meetings we've held recently. So welcome to Chandra. And um, I hope you'll have the opportunity to ask Chandra perhaps some specific sort of more on the ground operational type type questions. So let's uh, make a start with our, with our presentation. Um, just uh, to give you a broad view of, of who we are, um, where we've been around for almost 150 years. We're a UK aim-listed company, uh, uh, but in recent years, the focus has been increasingly uh, and now more or less exclusively on sustainable Indonesian palm oil. Um, we have almost 52,000 hectares of either our own uh, group-owned uh, areas or um, uh, areas um, uh, which are managed by us on behalf of the so-called scheme smallholders, the, the cooperative farmer uh, units which are attached to our new projects uh, where we develop uh, their plantations to the same, exactly the same high standards as our own, um, but we take in their fruit and process their fruit uh, through our mills and there's a mutual benefit there. Um, we're growing and growing, and we're now proud to say we have more than 10,000 employees in the group. Um, uh, seven of us in Tunbridge Wells and the rest are, uh, the rest are in Indonesia. Um, and then, of course, they're not only the employees, but their families as well. So we have you know, many people, if you like, dependent are, are on us, and we take that responsibility very seriously. 
Um, we've invested uh, over half a billion dollars into the Indonesian palm oil, uh, sustainable palm oil plantation sector in the last uh, 15 years or so since we decided to sell our small Malaysian plantations and uh, go for it in terms of uh, significant expansion into sustainable Indonesian palm oil. Um, just looking at the map, um, you'll see the various red dots. Um, th this is good in that um, our plantations are generally of a, a good size or economic unit, um, but uh, and and um, uh, uh, warrant the uh, a, a mill to serve those economic units. Um, there's just one plantation up in the northern part of Sumatra, which is too small. Uh, to have its own mill, but ideally that's up at uh, Simpankiri Estate, um, um, which is only about two and a half thousand hectares. But we would like to add more land. If we can secure more land around it, we would then be able to build what will be our seventh mill. Uh, we've built, we've got five mills up and running already. Uh, we have a six mill due to go uh, up um, by the end of uh, next year, 2022, down in uh, Musirawas, which is the southwesterly part of uh, Sumatra Island. Um, uh, and then we'll talk about further expansion that we're planning in due course. Uh, we also have the remnants of our uh, Bertam, uh, sorry, our Malaysian estate uh, ventures, which has now become all about property development. Um, and we're in the course of selling the small piece of land into called Bertam Estate into Bertam Properties, which is a joint, joint venture company, which we've owned uh, for 25 years, which has developed a new town. So we, uh, by default, in a sense, in Malaysia, become property developers. And that sale of the last piece of land into Bertam Properties is likely to go through in, in, uh, later in this year. Um, and then ultimately, we will sell out of Malaysia altogether. That sale value has a, a total value of about 24 million US dollars. Uh, moving to the next uh, slide, this is just to give you a broad overview of what I have to say were um, r rather good results. Um, we, um, I mean, in a sense, it was no surprise that we uh, were able to achieve the crops that we achieved uh, and indeed the CPO production because the, the, the crop uh, growth is on an upward trajectory that we fully expect and it's in line with expectation. Um, what um, uh, it was a, a nice, uh, very nice bonus was the uh, strong palm oil market. So the, um, the results, the earnings that you see below uh, the very substantial increase in earnings are uh, essentially a function of the, uh, the, the higher crops and the, um, the higher price, which we'll talk more about that. Um, we'll also talk about the sustainability uh, pre premium. Perhaps, um, Matthew, you might talk a little bit about that and what exactly is a sustainability premium, uh, which uh, somebody has already asked us. Um, um, we'll talk more about the results in due course, so we'll move on to the next, uh, the next slide. Um, we thought we'd just reaffirm what our sort of core values are, um, what our core strategic objectives are. Uh, these aren't just um, uh, sort of um, buzzwords. They are, each one has a specific um, meaning for us. I mean, in terms of responsibility, this comes in many forms. That's the first of our sort of core pillars. Um, we are extremely responsible in our approach to the uh, environment. Uh, we've been active members of the RSPO almost since its inception in the early 2000s. Um, we uh, absolutely do not uh, deforest. We have a policy of zero waste. Uh, we produce organic uh, compost from the empty fruit bunches, which um, um, reduces the amount of inorganic fertilizer that, that we need to, to buy. We produce green energy. Um, we, 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 take the, we capture the methane and we scrub it to turn it into electricity, which serves all our needs on our, the various estates where we have the uh, biogas plants and there will be more to come. 
Um, so it serves our needs in terms of our electricity requirements on the estates and more. We're able to sell surplus electricity into the, into the grid. And that accounted, in addition to our other sustainability premium of just uh, under two million, a further half a million or so by way of uh, electricity sales. And then there's also, the, if you like, the, the, the saving of what we would have had to spend on electricity had we not been able to produce our own green energy. Um, our theme of responsibility ties in very closely with that of excellence. Um, we're, we're delighted um, um, to have had Chandra on board with us uh, since he joined in 2008. And uh, Chandra's approach to agronomic uh, man management it is absolutely one of, one of excellence. And that culture is instilled from the top right down to the, you know, to the harvesters and to the, the weeders are, are on the ground. Um, so, um, uh, this is um, uh, something which uh, very much ties in with our, with our strategic values. Um, we are investing not only in the assets themselves and the plantations and the mills, but, but also in the people in a, 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 that work for us in a, in a responsible way. Um, we provide them with uh, not only with, uh, with good housing, but also uh, leisure facilities and also um, um, uh, schooling, particularly on the, the new, uh, newer, more remote plantations, which don't have good schools. And that's an added incentive, a magnet to attract good quality managers who might be a little bit wary or leery of actually going to a more remote project. But if they know there's good education uh, there on their doorstep, that's, that serves as a magnet to induce them to go and work for us there. Um, the, the excellence, uh, the excellent quality of our agro agronomic practices uh, links in with uh, the theme of growth. And the growth comes from essentially three, uh, three sources. Our, our crop volumes and our CPO, CPO production will grow by virtue of the fact that our palms are young and they will be growing and they will produce more fruit and there will be more CPO. If we don't plant a single further palm, uh, our production will grow significantly over the next number of years to come. It, it will also grow because of the continuing good, better, excellent practices that we instill, getting the maximum for every single palm that is in the ground. And finally, and something we perhaps slightly underplayed in the past, um, is our ambition, and we believe a realistic ambition, to um, acquire, to secure new areas in the first instance around our existing projects uh, where we have mills to make better use uh, of our existing uh, and excess mill capacity rather than buying in uh, uh, a significant amount of independent smallholder fr uh, fruit. Uh, we'd like to exchange that, if you like, for the, although that is profitable, for a significantly more profitable activity of uh, growing more of our own crops from newly purchased areas. And Chandra will talk more about this and the opportunities for um, growth, first around our existing projects, but ultimately, as we look further ahead, perhaps the next three to five years, more of the sorts of 10,000 hectare projects that we've acquired uh, back in the more recent past in the 2017, the Bumi Mass uh, purchase, uh, or before that, um, the Musi Rawas purchase. One was an old, um, uh, well, actually a relatively newly planted um, palm oil estate, that's Bumi Mass. The, the other, Musi Rawas, uh, is a very old smallholder sort of rubber project. In each case, we've helped to rehabilitate or improve those projects to, to bring them up to a sort of excellent, uh, excellent standard. And finally, uh, the fourth pillar, as it were, is that of yield, and in this instance, I mean dividend yield, uh, giving uh, an increasingly better yield, uh, better return to, to our shareholders uh, on the back of our uh, increasingly higher growth uh, and, and uh, better and better results. Uh, this is just really um, um, uh, a little bit more on that subject. An example of one of our schools in the top left, uh, top right, an example of on Bumi Mass, um, the quality of our new housing, 
the quality of our new planting, the quality of the roads that we put in, it all serves to make better and better uh, yields, better and better results from what we have, making the, making the most and the best of what we actually own. Um, the example of the growth, the historic growth is shown on the uh, bottom left uh, box. Um, this is where we have come from in the last 10 years. It shows a combination of growth from our own production, from that of our own scheme smallholders, um, and that processed in our mills from our so-called the independent smallholders whose fruit we buy in from outside. And then historically, this shows uh, uh, the, the yield, the dividends that we've paid. It's unusual for a particularly an AIM company uh, to have been able to uh, maintain, uh, uh, only to maintain or increase uh, uh, dividends over a 10-year span. In fact, we've achieved this over more than 25 years. Uh, and even more so for a commodities-based uh, company whose income relies uh, well, really exclusively now, are on um, the, the, the revenue from the palm oil, but yet because of our substantially increasing crops, that helps to mitigate against the effects of any uh, decreases in the price. And we feel confident about being able to continue to deliver higher and higher uh, dividends as we grow more and more. Uh, just on the palm oil market itself, I mean, the, this was extremely strong by historic standards. Um, we saw uh, the SIF Rotterdam price increase by 72%, uh, at times well over $1,200 a ton. I think the historic high is around $1,400, uh, which obviously was, was very good news. Not such good news was the fact that in uh, December of 2020, uh, the in Indonesian government introduced an additional export tax over that already imposed. Uh, it was quite a swinging uh, additional tax, um, which was done in order to help to subsidize the producers in Indonesia of biofuel, biodiesel, uh, because the Indonesian government had the ambition to uh, have more and more biofuel as part of the, the, the mix in, 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 in their diesel production. Um, nonetheless, we were still able to achieve an increase of 34% uh, in the actual uh, price, uh, the bottom line price that we received, averaging $724 per tonne uh, for the first, first half of the year. Um, the reasons for the strong market were partly because vegetable oil stocks generally uh, uh, were low, uh, and uh, because production was down. In terms of the, the vegetable market as a whole, um, uh, the Americas, both North and, and South America, experienced, uh, um, sadly for them, weather issues affecting the soybean crops there, which has uh, affected production. And soybean, soy oil is the second biggest vegetable after uh, palm oil. Um, but also specific to palm oil, um, uh, Malaysia, which is the second biggest producer of um, palm oil after Indonesia, and the two countries between them account for almost 85% of the world's palm oil production. So Malaysia experienced very serious uh, difficulties and problems related to labor. They are almost wholly dependent on immigrant labor. Um, and uh, due to the pandemic, um, um, sadly, they were um, much of this labor was no longer available, um, and therefore they couldn't get in and harvest, they couldn't get in and spread fertilizer. And even if they get up and running again, the fact that they haven't distributed fertilizer will mean that they're likely not to be able to return to former levels uh, for some time uh, to come. Uh, Indonesia did not experience the same difficulties because they have a population 10 times the size and are not reliant on immigrant labor. Um, following the end of the period, uh, palm oil prices have remained strong. Um, the forward market shows prices remain uh, strong through to the end of this year and indeed uh, beyond. So there's some sign of a bit of softening as we go into next year, but by historical standards, uh, still um, um, a lot of strength uh, evident. Now, at this point, I'd like to hand over to Chandra to talk about the operations and initially about um, 
the impact or otherwise of COVID on our operations. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, COVID, as you know, uh, has uh, there was a pan uh, there is an existing pandemic, as you all know, and Indonesia uh, was considered as the epicenter of the Delta variant after India three months ago. Today, numbers have decreased uh, drastically. As I speak, yesterday there, there was 3,786 cases, uh, the whole of Indonesia that was reported, and 276 cases of death. Uh, speaking about MP Evans uh, or PT Evans in Indonesia, uh, for the last 24 months, we had 387 cases, 387 cases and uh, no deaths. As I speak today, we have 38 cases, infected cases, all in isolation. The group remains very vigilant in monitoring the situation very carefully. We are very sensitive about this. All estates and mills over the last two years, 24 months during the pandemic have continued to operate without any inter in interruption at all. Uh, when necessary, especially in the Jakarta main office, head office, remote working is in place for mainly administrative functions. Uh, especially senior staff continue to travel within Indonesia uh, as part of the normal operational management and support. Vaccination rates have in are increasing over 40% of the group's workforce, having received at least one vaccination. As you know, we are very dependent on the Indonesian government uh, on, on availability of vaccines, but I'm very confident in the last quarter we can achieve at least 60 to 70 percent double dose vaccination. Uh, next, please. Okay. This is on crop growth. The bar charts that you see uh, reflects on crop as, as at June 2021 and 2020. The green bar, the, the last green bar, the very uh, right, shows total crop processed. What is total crop processed made out, made out of? It's own crops. Schemes called smallholder crops, these are schemes, plasma schemes or kakapia schemes, as they are called, that we develop for the villagers who, who gave up their land to let us develop uh, the land into a plantation. Uh, these are schemes, smallholders, we develop it and we manage it for them. And then we have ind independent smallholder crops. These, these are crops that... Uh, that this is a crop that is basically sourced from outside farmers. We purchase this to improve the mill utilization. So, as at June this year, we we processed a total of seven hundred and two thousand three hundred tons, compared to five hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred tons. Why is this so? This is mainly because of our average age of palms has increased and we are going into the prime stage of our uh, our growth uh, of, of our palm growth and uh, yeah uh, so if we break break down in our own crops we also uh, produce 413000 uh, as at june 2021 compared to 334,100 as at June 2020. Uh, you will see that there is a surge uh, of own crop, mainly because of age of palm. Uh, schemes called smallholders also showed a bigger increase of 43%. Independent smallholders, we, we started buying aggressively uh, smallholder crops because in 2020 and 2021, we increased our milling capacity. We had two mills, one in, in the Kota Bangun project, 
and one in the new Bumi Mass project. So we had two new 60 ton mills in operations, and this uh, made us uh, uh, concentrate also on independent smallholder crop. Next slide, please. Next, okay. This is a very important uh, graph uh, which shows our increased milling capacity. The linear graph, the linear line shows our milling capacity increase over the years. Yeah. You will notice that from 220 to 221, there, there is an upward trend. Uh, this is when two more mills ca came into operation. Uh, the bar charts show our growth in uh, our own crop, smallholders, smallholder crop, and also uh, the purchase of outside crop. That, that is reflected by the orange bar. C CPO production in the first half was 161,400 tons in comparison to uh, the first half 220, which, uh, where we process only 124,800. Production cost is lowest when milling our own crop in group mills. Produ production cost from our own crop was US $335 per ton. That is, that is the cost of producing one ton of oil, one ton of CPO. And uh, this is basically from our own crop. But total production cost in group mills was US $437 per ton. This is because this is uh, the, the crop that we buy from our smallholders as well as from the farmers. We, we pay uh, an extra amount, which is related to the CPO price of the market. Uh, nevertheless, the, the margins are still very, very attractive. Uh, as I said earlier, there were two mills that were commissioned in 2020 and 2021 in uh, Kalimantan and uh, the group sixth mill will be underway in Musi Rawas. Work has started on uh, uh, landfilling and the tender process is, is uh, ongoing. We hope to complete this mill in 222 end. Uh, the margin, the margin increases as more of our own crop is milled in our own mills. We hope uh, in the end of 222, 96% of our own crop uh, will be processed by when our sixth mill opens in Musirawas. We continue to invest in planting. Planting has restarted in Musirawas. Why I say restarted? Because the Roundtable Sustainability Oil Palm Organization had put in more uh, stringent laws towards deforestation, uh, carbon stock, etc. So we had uh, we had already planted eight thousand hectares in Musirawas prior to this, and when the rules were implemented, we had to. Uh, submit all our documents, all our documents, and it has it had to be verified by RSPO. Uh, so we just received the green light in July to carry on, and uh, we expect to plant at least ten thousand hectares in Musirawas. And uh, as I I said many times before, the sixth mill in Musirawas will be prioritized in two twenty two. The group continues to invest in biogas plants, bulking facilities, infrastructure, and regional offices, offices to support the growth. The group is also uh, looking at acquisition opportunities for sustainable new land around our existing estates. Uh, basically, we are concentrating our growth around our existing estates for the time being, for the short term, for the short term. Number one, this is to maximize our milling capacity. Uh, we also uh, like a very measured growth uh, as we got to have a very good management team to 
lead the next uh, large project. So this has to be done very carefully and very thoughtfully. Uh, Peter, uh, Matthew, you can carry on. That's great. Thank you very much, Chandra. If we turn now and just spend a little bit of time talking about the results themselves for the uh, for the first half of, of 2021. And uh, it's great to be able to share them with you. And uh, I think you'll see very clearly from the slide there that the theme, the theme is increase and dramatic increase at that. And if we start with revenue for the first half of this year, that was up by 69%. So up to $128 million for the first half of for the first half of this year. And as I'm sure some of you will have heard me refer to before, determining our, determining our revenue is really a very straightforward exercise. It's a case of looking at our CPO production and our Millgate price and multiplying the two together. It's it's no more complicated than that. And you, you've heard You've heard about both of those two factors already um, as part of our, our discussion today. So Chandra was telling you about CPO production, how that's up to 161,000 tonnes in the first half of this year, up by 29%. And Peter was talking about prices, how the headline price of CPO has, has jumped up by 72% in the first half of this year, but how we've still seen a very big increase, a 34% increase in our Millgate pricing for the oil that we sell to $724 per tonne on average. And it's simply taking those two together, we get a big increase to $128 million of revenue in, in the first half. Peter referenced sustainability premia as well. And because of the... Uh, the accreditation and the certification that we have at a number of our mills, we're able to sell a significant part of our output as certified sustainable oil. Um, at the moment, it's just over half of our oil that we're able to sell, 54% of our oil that we're able to sell as certified sustainable oil. And because we're able to sell it with that certification attached, we're able to obtain an extra premium for the oil that we sell, um, a small extra on top of the, the headline price for the oil that we sell. It's not a huge amount, but it makes a difference. And importantly, it's increasing as well. So you can see that the, the sustainability premium income uh, more than doubled in the first half of this year, which we're very pleased to report to you. So just under $2 million of income from sustainability premiums that we were able to secure in the first half of this year. Then looking at profitability, so you can see a, a, you know, a big increase in gross margin in the first half of this year, up from 12% in the first half of 2020 to 33% in the first half of 2021. Now, of course, a big part of that is because of the increase we saw in pricing but that's not the whole story. We continue to be very focused on controlling our costs. And the output of that focus is that production cost fell in the first half of this year. And that's, that's measuring production cost for our, our own fruit going through our own mills. That's at the core of our business, our own fruit being processed in our own milling facilities. And you can see that was down significantly to $335 per tonne in the first half of this year. Chandra also referenced the $437 per tonne, which is our total cost of production in our, in our own mills. And when you blend everything together, so our own fruit and the purchased fruit going through our mills, that comes out to that 437 figure. And that is a little bit up on the previous period, but as Chandra also mentioned, that's a reflection of the fact that the price we pay for buying in fruit is indeed pegged to the CPO price itself. So you would expect to see that increase a little bit as CPO prices are higher. So you know, we understand why that's gone up a little bit, but overall, of course, we're making a larger profit. So you know, we're, we're, we're okay with that. 
Moving then, you know, we see how all of this feeds its way through the income statements to the bottom line and how we have that big jump this year compared to last year in earnings per share. So we're in the first half of 2020, earnings per share were just under 6 pence, 5.7. So earnings per share in the first half of this year were 38.3 pence, a significant change. And of course, that very much supports the plan we have to be focused on increasing returns to our shareholders. Moving on then, and, and, and looking at uh, cash and balance sheet measures, very important to note that we continue to be very cash generative and our cash generation is increasing substantially. So where in the first half of last year, our operating cash generation was just over $11 million. That's almost trebled in the first half of this year to $33 million. And that's measuring operating cash before interest and tax payments, which is a consistent measure. That's the, the measure we always report in these presentations. And what have, we, what have we been using our cash for? Well, of course, we've been using it to continue our capital investment program. Um, $15.1 million deployed towards capital investment in the first half of this year. A big part of that towards completing mill number five, which was opened just after the end of the first half of this year. Mill number five opened at our Booby Mass estate, commissioned in August of this year. And then important to note that a significant amount of cash was used in returning dividends to shareholders, so $13.1 million was used for paying dividends to shareholders in the first half of 2021. And despite those uses of cash, we continue to reduce net debt. So net debt was down to $67 million at the end of the first half. One big factor in helping with that was repayment of funding that we'd given to scheme, sharehold, uh, sorry, scheme smallholders um, during the first half of this year. So we provide initial funding to scheme smallholders when they, when they plant and develop their areas attached to our own estates. Uh, but as those areas become mature, as, those, as the yields from those areas increase and the operating cash flows increase, so repayments come back to the group from those scheme smallholders and $13 million was repaid to the group in the first half of this year. And overall, if we measure against the first half of last year compared to the end of the first half this year, there's been over, over a 20% reduction in the group's net debt. And you can see where we stand in terms of balance sheet overall, over $390 million of net assets, a very strong position net gearing at 15%. And we believe that very much supports the group's plans for continuing investment and continuing growth. Just a brief comment on where, where we are after the end of the first half of 2021. Included in the interim report was uh, some information about crop up to the end of August, so all the way through to the end of last month. And at, at that point, we were up to 928,000 tonnes of uh, crop processed overall. Chandra was sharing with you where we were at the end of June with just over 700,000 tonnes. So you can see how we've progressed in the last two months. At the end of, at the end of June, comparing to last year, we were 28% up year on year. And so we continue to be 28% up when we move forward to the end of August with 900, 928 compared to 725 thousand tons. So you can see that crop growth is continuing as we move through into the second half of the year. Then when it comes to pricing, we were $724 per tonne as an average for the first six months of the year. That's moved on even further as we, as we move through to the end of August. And our average pricing all the way through to the end of August has stepped up to 738 so you get a sense of just how strong CPO pricing has been in July and August. And of course, that both of these factors absolutely continues to underpin our plans when it comes to 
returns to shareholders for 2021. I don't think I need to say too much more about these strategic and operational priorities. You've heard about them already. Construction of Mill 6, focusing on planting at Musiraras as well as building that mill, making sure we get to our minimum planted area of 10,000 hectares. And we've already spoken to you about that priority to identify acquisitions of additional land around our existing projects. So that just leaves one final thing for me to, to share with you, which is really just an, an, an illustration, but hopefully a, a, a useful and valuable illustration to share with you, which is really looking at where, where returns may be based on crop process between 1.4 and 1.8 million tonnes, taking a few what we believe to be perfectly sensible and reasonable assumptions. The key assumption that I draw your attention to is the gross profit per tonne of palm product, where we have assumed for the purposes of this illustration, this piece of modeling, $200 of profit, of gross profit per tonne of palm product. And if you, if you make that assumption, and I should point out that if you go back and look at where we are in the first half of of 2021, we're actually achieving more than $200 per tonne of gross profit. But if you make that $200 per tonne assumption, along with the, the other assumptions you can see on the slide, 1.4 million tonnes of crop processed would lead you through to 70 pence of earnings per share. And then as you go across the slide, you can see 1.8 million tonnes of crop processed would lead you to 90 pence of earnings per share. I think the other two points at the bottom of the slide are, I would hope, relatively self-evident from, from the slide and from what, from what you've seen. An increase in crop would obviously form the basis for those higher earnings and therefore an opportunity to accelerate shareholder returns. And then whilst, whilst the illustration itself doesn't deal with cash, one might expect cash flows and free cash flows to increase even more sharply once you get to a point where depreciation steps up and steps in front of capital expenditure. And just to go back to where we are, of course, we've just completed mill number five in our, in our program of increasing our milling capacity. And we aim to complete mill number six by the end of next year or around the end of next year. And we would expect that really to be a point at which we might expect depreciation to start running ahead of capital expenditure as we've completed that, that mill expansion program across our existing portfolio of properties. So hopefully a, a, a useful illustration to reflect on in terms of what crop process can lead to is some sensible, possibly even conservative assumptions in terms of earnings per share. So at that point, I will pass back to Peter just for some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Well, just uh, to conclude indeed, um, regarding our strategy and our values, we uh, aim very much to uh, grow in a responsible and in an excellent way. Uh, and in order to help to deliver um, greater returns to our shareholders. Um, we are looking forward to growing crops, to increasing milling capacity, and to our continuing investment. Initially, over the next two to three years, around our existing projects, there could be significant scope for, um, for growth, uh, the acquisition of land around our existing projects, to make best use of our milling capacity, 
But as we go a bit further forward at bigger acquisitions, perhaps, perhaps more like the sort of 10,000 hectare type uh, project that we've seen in the likes of Bumimas or uh, Musirawas. Um, we've produced, I hope you'll agree, an outstanding set of results for the first half with revenue up 69%, gross margin uh, up from 12% to 33%, earnings per share up from 5.7p to 38.3p. Um, and we have a very exciting future ahead, we believe, um, with um, increases in crop yield and, and milling, um, which will support higher production and cash flows, um, and certainly the opportunity for further increases in shareholder returns. Um, so that, that uh, concludes uh, the formal part of our presentation. Uh, we seem to have uh, a number of questions which we'd be delighted to uh, to, to answer. Um, so perhaps uh, we'll just have a moment to uh, to consider those. Peter, th thank you very much for your presentation there. L ladies and gentlemen, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right corner of the screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Me Company platform. In investors have submitted a number of questions during the presentation today, and I just wanted to hand back to, so that you can respond to those where it is appropriate for you guys to do so. So could I please ask you to read out the question and then who it is from? Um, yes, thank you very much, Ali. Just... Uh, I think uh, actually there's a pretty uh, a good range of questions, and we can probably take them from the top, as it were. Um, the first is: Can you add any detail on how easy or difficult it is to get permission to do extension planting? Have you anything to add about the land titles you were waiting for, as mentioned in the annual report? Um, I mean, in terms of extension planting. Um, I mean, there's the, the Musirawas extension, the, the, con the continuing planting of the land we already own, for which we have now been given permission. Um, so um, uh, that, that uh, has already got underway. Um, uh, and we expect, as Chandra said, to uh, reach at least uh, 10,000 hectares, hopefully closer to 11 or 12,000 hectares. Um, in terms of um, planting that we might achieve in areas that we might acquire, um, and maybe that links in with the question about land titles, uh, if we were to acquire new land titles, um, I mean, we're unlikely to be acquire anything uh, which is more of a green fields type site. We'll tend to, uh, e e even if it's not environmentally sensitive, generally we'll go for brown Brown fields and um, the land titles will come with the acquisition of the projects that we acquire, unless I'm missing something regarding land titles. There's something that you would add on that. Um, the, the only thing I would add on land titles is obviously we report um, in each year's annual report the status of final um, receipt of the last stage, which, which is, um, some of our uh, uh, some some of the people on our call today may be familiar with, which is called the HGU, um, and in some instances uh, we were in the process of obtaining the final land titles in our existing portfolio of, of estates. We're very close to receiving those final land titles. Yeah. That process goes on exactly as you would expect, and exactly as part of the routine process. Uh, we will. You know, we, we don't give a, f a full analysis of that as part of the interim report. We will give a further update on that as part of the annual report. But you know, there, there, is, there is nothing of concern to report. That process just you know, continues as you would expect. Fine, shall we continue to scroll down? Um, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, a question on um, on the change of CEO. Um, I don't think there's really anything that I can add to what uh, 
what has already been said in public and what I, I, I just said, uh, but I would just add that the business continues to be managed uh, very effectively. We believe both from, uh, from Tunbridge Wells and indeed uh, from uh, um, Jakarta. Um, so moving on to the next question, would you ever consider a dual listing on an exchange more local to the operations? We have considered this and um, to be honest, I think generally speaking, uh, I mean, being listed on one exchange comes with a lot of, uh, you know, bu bureaucracy um, and it would just be double the amount of bureaucracy and I think without uh, the sort of uh, returns that one might wish for. Um, uh, so I, I don't think we've been convinced on that. Um, I think also it might affect for those um, private investors, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, a dual listing might uh, affect the IHT status for those uh, shareholders who are private investors on AIM, uh, where one of the reasons, besides the many other reasons for investing, is uh, for the IHT status. Um, but um, we, we certainly haven't been convinced that it would uh, improve our rating by having a dual listing, but it's something we will continue to keep an open mind on, but uh, certainly not been persuaded on that so far. Um, Perhaps, Matthew, you might take the next question. Uh, yeah, happy to do so. Uh, we have a question about the information we provide um, in relation to our, our associate companies. Question being, is there any reason that we don't publish the pre-tax figure for the share of our associated company profits? Uh, the simple answer is, is no. Um, we're obliged under the rules to bring into our income statement our share of those companies' post-tax profits, and that's what we do um, in our in our annual. I had to remind myself, and I just just had a look in our in our annual report. Report we provide quite a large amount of information about the um, both the income statement and the balance sheet of our associated companies. Um, we provide information about their revenue, about a summary of their balance sheets, uh, and quite a large amount of information. As it happens, we don't we don't share what their uh, pre-tax profits are, just their post-tax profits. But it's not because we're seeking to hide anything; it's just because that's what we're yeah we, we're obliged to disclose under the uh, under the accounting rules. Fine. Uh, the next question is: Do you see corporate acquisitions as being part of your future development? Um, it's a good, a good question. Um, we've referred to our aspirations in terms of acquiring initially parcels of perhaps two to 3,000 hectares, further down the line, more like 10,000 hectares. Um, some of the, the owners, even of the smaller uh, uh, parcels, are sort of co corporate entities in Indonesia. Uh, some of them are partnerships. Um, it's perhaps not quite you had in, what you had in mind in the in the question. Um, what I think we will not be likely to be looking at is large scale M and A. Um, we believe that the more organic approach to um, to expansion is is the better one for us. This ties in with our uh, our ambitions of of excellence. And just spreading our excellence too thinly, if you like, can be dangerous. Um, we think what we do, we do very well, and we can cope with a gradual uh, growth uh, program, but suddenly to merge in with another group, uh, whoever that might be, um, um, of, uh, say, a similar size or, or whatever, I think that would not be without its challenges. Um, and I think one has to look at really what, what the best value per share for every shareholder is. So we'd have to look long and hard before we looked at a large scale M&A type proposal, more organic uh, generally than that. Um, we've got a question on dividend cover. Would you like to address that, Matthew? Yes, happy to do so. So the question that's come in asks, what do we consider to be a reasonable dividend cover in, in the future? 
And the straightforward answer to that question is that we do not set for ourselves a particular target for achieving a certain level of dividend cover. Um, the, the reason for that is partly because of the nature of the, of the industry and the business within which we operate, um, but also a reflection of the fact, hopefully, uh, of the of two strands or two aspects, if I can call, call them those, of what you would have heard about in our presentation and our, and our, our pillars, our strategic pillars. We are focused on continuing growth in the business and ensuring that we have the resources to continue with developing and growing the business for the future, but also on ensuring that we're able to continue delivering increasing returns for our shareholders. And so it's about managing that balance. And we want to ensure that we have the flexibility to continue to manage that balance. So we're not going to set hard and fast rules about dividend cover has to be X or Y but making sure we have the, the flexibility to enable us to do both of those things. Um, the next question is, uh, just briefly, we have talked about uh, expansion. Have you identified any significant larger acquisitions? Um, we, we have um, certainly identified a number of projects of the sort of two to 3,000 hectare size. We've uh, been pursuing one or two of those. There's nothing which we're ready to report on. We haven't been pursuing the bigger 10,000 hectare type projects yet, um, but we certainly identified uh, uh, a number of projects and we're hopeful that, uh, you know, by exploring and pursuing a number of them that, you know, one or two of them will be, uh, will come through and be successful. Um, the, the next question is, is on selling forward. Given the current strong pricing environment, can you, would you sell forward a proportional anticipated production to lock in the good pricing at the moment? Now, we get this sort of question a lot. I have to say, one of the reasons we have performed so well uh, for the first half and indeed uh, in, in the recent past is because specifically we don't lock in large volumes uh, in advance. It's always so tempting uh, for companies to see a, a strong price and what's regarded as strong and to want to lock it in and uh, uh, for the next you know, three to six months or, or, or further ahead. And we would always maintain, and we believe we're, um, we're, 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 we're justified in this and vindicated in it, that it's very hard to better the average price over time. Um, and I have to say, I think our average price that we've achieved is significantly better than, than many others, precisely because we don't attempt to outperform, outdo better the, the market. Um, so we a little bit take the rough with the smooth. I mean, we give ourselves a little bit of flexibility, um, but broadly speaking, we spread our sales over a given month or uh, over a period of time. Uh, and where we really focus our marketing efforts is on achieving better and better premia for the uh, through a sustainability premia from what we are uh, a, able to sell. So um, we, we, we're not looking to change our approach on that. Um, and now from, uh, we have a, a one on earnings per share. Uh, so do, um, have you looked at this? Uh, do, would you like to answer it, Matthew? Sorry, I'm yeah, not ready yet. No, yeah. that's fine. That's no problem. So we have a question around earnings per share. Uh, the question says, earnings per share for 2021 is likely to exceed 80 pence. However, you are projecting earnings per share for year three at 80p, so effectively no growth forecast in the next two years. Please comment. Um, I, I actually I appreciate you raising this, thank you, because it helps me to clarify any, any misunderstanding in yeah. this area. Yeah. Um, firstly, um, uh, the opening statement earnings per share for 2021 is likely to exceed ATP. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that you think so. Um, it's obviously not, not for me to, to comment, so uh, let's just park that thought. But particularly on the question of the uh, project, what you're calling the projection, um, and the fact that in year three that shows eighty pence, and so you're, you're you're sort of linking those two those two those two things. Um, what what we had on the slide there 
was was very much designed to be uh, hopefully as I was I was, I was tr I'm trying to emphasize but maybe I didn't make the point clearly enough it was very much a, a sort of piece of modeling an illustration and in, in, as you, in, in year three of, of, of that model it, yes it did show 80 pens but that was um, as I say based upon, upon that fundamental assumption of achieving two hundred dollars of gross profit per ton of palm product. At the moment, as I say, we are running ahead of two hundred dollars per ton of palm product. So I think you need to slightly separate out in your mind the two things and see that what we were showing as a as a piece of illustration and modeling was based upon a set of assumptions, whereas what's going on at the moment in the real world maybe some maybe rather different. Yeah, I mean, what, what is clear is if uh, the crops continue to go up, which we know they will significantly, and if the price were to stay the same as it is now, clearly the earnings would increase significantly. Um, and even if the price falls, that will be sort of miti mitigated against by the signif significantly rising crops. Exactly. Exactly. Um, a comment on the exchange. I think, exactly, I think we have one final question. Yeah. It seems to be a final question yeah. about exchange rates uh, and about the, the uh, Indonesia dollar, the, the rupiah dollar exchange rate, asking whether perhaps the, the rupiah has stopped depreciating against the US dollar and is this a new trend? Um, the honest answer to that question is we don't know. Um, it it, it uh, certainly has been more stable um, over, over a period of time and certainly over the majority of, of this year. But as, as to whether that's a new trend, um, you know, <laughs> if, 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 we, if we all knew that for certain sure, then no, no, no doubt there'd be some way in which we'd be working the currency markets and we all, we'd all be very rich indeed. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's very hard to say it's... Uh, uh, it's an impossible question, I'm afraid. Yeah, Matthew, but uh, let, let's take that as the last question. I just thought, Chandra, it might be interesting just on the, because I, we've been very much uh, promoting this uh, uh, notion, this ambition of seeking to acquire uh, more land, and you haven't had a chance to comment on that yourself. I think it might be quite good for people just to see a little bit of sort of local uh, color on that. What's your take, your perspective on how available land is and what the opportunities are and what what you know how likely we are to be successful in securing land in the way we would like to uh, <clears throat> basically uh, acquiring land in indonesia is very complicated it has seen the downfall of many many plantation groups number one uh, uh, land is a plenty land is a plenty and uh, the licenses involved are very tricky. You have to be very, very careful. Uh, what most plantations, why most plantations have failed, they like the word expansion, they like the word growth, but they do not check within whether they have the people to, to maintain uh, the plantation well, to, to look after the plantation well. Uh, in the end, you're more established plantations will lose out on quality. So here I, I've instilled and I've always advised the board, do not, do not uh, you know, expand uh, crazily and then lose control. Many plantations have done that. I, I, I come from, I used to come from a company that believes on, 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 on uh, quantity rather than quality. In the end, uh, there's no consolidation. So here in MP Evans, uh, we grow in a very uh, structured manner. Uh, number one, we, we uh, look at, look at the uh, land that we want to acquire, look at the licenses very carefully, uh, look at the people. Uh, you see, Indonesia is so large you also got to look at the culture of the people, uh, whether they accept us, uh, the, you know, the opposition that we are going to face. And then we also have to look at the sustainability part. 
Is it logged over? Is it a brown field? Right now, with all, all the implications, we, we are not going to touch any uh, any other... Most of the time, we are not going to touch any other, other project than a brown field, which has been planted with the oil palm. And that is what I would recommend to the board. Because, because uh, we, we are following the sustain, sustainability route uh, by the book. So, you know, uh, we have got our priorities. We have to be careful. We have to look after our shareholders. Uh, I, I don't uh, foresee this uh, crazy kind of expansion. Uh, we are not, not volume players. Uh, we, we have to have seek the balance between quality and volume. There was this question about extension of, of permits and and uh, licenses. Uh, if you do the right things, if you have all your documents right, uh, it will take time, but it has it has never been a problem. It has we have got all our hagios, uh, e even the Kalimantan, even the Musirawas project has been completed, but it took time. And uh, they would ask for all kinds of documents, all kind of requirements, but it's all stipulated in the law. What they ask is all stipulated in the law. Hmm. And uh, if we provide them, they, they would be late, but we have eventually got nearly every certificate that is required. And I don't foresee extension of these permits as a problem. Okay. That, that's very good. Thank you, Chandra, for that, uh, that very much local input of what's, what really does happen. Um, and you're right, things often take time in Indonesia, but we, we get there. We get there in the end. Um, do, do, shall I hand back to you, Ali, for a moment? P Peter, Matthew, Chandra, thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. You actually addressed all the questions from investors today. And of, and of course, the company will review any further questions submitted and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Peter, just before redirecting investors for feedback, I wondered if I could ask you for a few closing comments. Sure. Well, just to say once again, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, and thank you for your um, many uh, questions. Um, I hope we've been able to give you a flavor of, uh, of where we are and, and where we're going. Uh, and what the prospects are. Um, and we very much uh, look forward to seeing you um, again uh, soon. And uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch if you've got any further specific uh, questions. So thank you so much again for, for, for attending. Thanks again for up updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you will now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of MP Evans Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all.